Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast is brought to you by Compassion International. For $38 a month, your tax-deductible contribution each month connects a child living in poverty with a loving church-based child sponsorship program. This is where you and I can come in and make a difference in a child's life. That $38 a month, and when we think about $38, what is that? Three bucks a day, right? Think about what $38 a month can do for you and I, and then think about what it's actually doing to this child in need. It's providing medical checkups, which in many cases can often save lives. It provides nutritious food, hygiene, training, and health, educational assistance, access to special services like surgeries, even disaster relief, mentoring to help children discover their incredible value as God's children. And most of all, most important of all, your sponsored child will hear about Jesus Christ and be encouraged to develop a lifelong relationship with the Lord. Consider sponsoring a child through Compassion by going to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. $38 a month. Consider releasing a child from poverty today. Today on the podcast, we welcome Mitchell Traver to the show. Mitchell is a TCU alum having pitched for the Horn Frogs and a former pro baseball pitcher. Mitchell played with TCU from 2012 to 2017, really didn't get on the mound until 2014 with TCU. And interestingly enough, he was selected by a Major League Baseball team four times. 2012, he was selected in the 39th round by the Houston Astros. 2015, he was selected in the 28th round by the St. Louis Cardinals. 2016, selected by the Cincinnati Reds in the 17th round. And 2017, The 20th round, he was taken by the Angels, and that's where he began his pro career, which only lasted a couple seasons because Mitchell Traver retired from baseball in 2019 at the age of 25. And so this story isn't the one that has the guy that goes and plays the 15 years, wins multiple Cy Youngs, and then praises God through all of that. No, this is a different type of story. This is a story of a guy who endured injury after injury, after injury. In his words, he was injured every single year from 2012 to 2019. And he kept persevering. He kept pushing through until this year when God had a different plan for his life and he decided to step away from pro baseball. This is a really interesting conversation about the dynamics of pursuing a dream, identity being found in a game that you love, and in many ways not even being able to fulfill what you believe is your potential to do all of that on the field because you can't stay healthy and yet staying faithful to God throughout the entire process. Mitchell Traber, his story is an inspiration. Take a listen to our conversation with former pro baseball pitcher and TCU Horn Frog, Mitchell Traver, here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Mitchell, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate your time, Jason. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. And you and I have known each other a little bit now through social media. And the beauty of social media is that you get to meet so many interesting people. And so I've been following your journey. And then all of a sudden, you know, I see on a post on Instagram that you're retiring from pro baseball and you're just 25 years old. Why don't we start there? Walk us through what led to you making this announcement at such a young age. Wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there, there was a lot that went into it, uh, a lot of time prior to it, it just, you know, kind of played into the, the long-term decision, a lot of people that we talked to, but, but ultimately the, the short version is, um, you know, the angels let me go in spring training after having been there for almost two years, but a year and a half. Um, I knew it was possible, but at the same time I was kind of surprised. Um, and I, you know, I had one full season there, so my wife and I, we had gotten married at this point about six months prior to that happening. Uh, we were talking through things and had had known that that was a possibility, but but didn't necessarily expect it. So um, at the time, you know, the plan was if something happened and 
you know, the angels let me go, you know, I would go the training route and, and, and would try and land with another team. Um, ideally I wouldn't play independent ball, but it was pretty much, you know, we, we would just see, but what was interesting after that happened, um, a couple things went down. Number one, I had already developed, um, another injury over the off season that it didn't keep me from pitching, but it kept me from training for a month. And so I was a little behind when I got to spring training, it wasn't too far, but I was a little behind and it was still kind of giving me trouble. So that would have been interesting to try and pitch through this season. Um, cause I do have a history of back injuries. And then on top of that, you know, when I talked to a couple different people regarding what I should do, they just, they kind of reminded me about the long-term goal. Um, and, and if anything, they just, they also reminded me about the purpose of gifts. And so the, the biggest takeaway that I had and ultimately what led to my wife and I considering for the first time, maybe we should step away from the game and move on was, um, Chauncey Franks, my FCA, um, character coach down at TCU. He's one of my best friends. He's been a mentor for years. He married my wife and I, he said, um, you know, Mitchell, you have a decision. You know, when God, as your father, gives you a gift, it's like a father with his child. You, know, you can either, when a father asks for something back, you can either hand it back and trust him or you can make him rip it out of your hands. And he wasn't necessarily saying that I had to let it go. It's just more so considering what if the Lord was calling me away from baseball? What if all of these things went down at the time and in the way that they did because it was time for me to move on to the next chapter? And, and did I have the ability to make that decision? And by God's grace, I did. Uh, we've had a lot of peace in it. Um, pretty much all the counsel we've received and the things we were looking for led in that direction. So um, ultimately, it wasn't a decision we thought we would make, but there's no question in our minds it was time to move on. You wrote in your Instagram posts in making the announcement, you said, My wife and I have prayed fervently and sincerely for the Lord to direct our hearts in the way we need to go. We've sought counsel from the wisest and most trusted people we know. And you talked about Chauncey Franks, and I'm sure there are others, but take us through the process of why seeking wise counsel was so important to you. Obviously, that's biblical, um, but I think there's a lot of people that are sitting in the midst of their lives right now, maybe trying to think of where to take that next step, or a big decision is looming, and they're not quite sure where to go, what to do. I know I made a big decision a couple of years ago to leave, in mm -hmm. essence, a dream job, and in essence, you kind of did the same thing, and walking away from a dream job, being a professional baseball pitcher. Take us through that process of praying, seeking that wise counsel, why it was so important for you. Mm. Yeah, so I love how the first thing you said was um, that it's biblical, because ultimately, as a Christian, that's that's going to drive everything that we do or it's supposed to anyway. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, you know, we know in Proverbs, there's wisdom in the counsel of many. Like, you, you know, you hear that um, over and over. It's one of the most often quoted Proverbs. So just just this idea of wise counsel from people that are older, more experienced, more mature, all of those things like any time we ask for help in anything, it, it's, it's a good idea. And you want to consider the source that you're asking it from. So again, for me, it's not that the sources I, I asked it from were all explicitly Christian, but you know, the most important counsel you're going to get is going to be biblical counsel. So you're going to want to ask someone who's, who's mature and is clearly following Christ. So that was what my wife and I did for the most part. Um, we're very fortunate, honestly, to have families um, who are Christ followers, um, who are full of them with, with both of our parents and even siblings for me. And um, there's people I've grown with and have walked this whole journey with. I mean, they didn't even need context because they've been with me every step of the way. So that was a massive asset that God gave me to make an extremely difficult decision. Um, but on, on, on top of that, there were some sources that, you know, weren't necessarily explicitly Christian too, but, but had the, the level of expertise that was necessary. So certain coaches, um, certain people who had been in the game for long periods of time, um, you just people who have been around, who know what they're talking about, who know what life is like on both sides, who know what to expect, who also have known me for some time. It just, that circle didn't have to be huge. But it did need to be big enough where I bounced it off of people who were going to help me see it from almost every number on the clock, if that makes sense. Um, and that's that's ultimately what th th that that blessed my wife and I. And then as far as prayer goes, that was the the foundation of the whole thing. I mean, you're obviously going to pray about these things and you're going to talk to the Lord about, OK, 
Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? You're going to be looking in his word. You're going to be praying his word back to him. But ultimately, it's not this, for, for, especially from my experience and from what I heard, it's not this still small voice where you're going to pray, say, God, give me the answer. And he's just going to whisper in your ear mystically. Yeah. That It's not that that's never happened. It's just more so on the norm. You're going to look for wisdom in the, in the in the word that he's given you and in the people that he's placed around you and make the best possible decision you can with the information that you have. And then the biggest thing we prayed for was, Lord, if we're getting this wrong, lead us the other way. Close the door, you know, slam a door where we can't possibly screw this up. Um, and we believe he did that. Mitchell Traver is our guest here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. In that post that you wrote on Instagram, you mentioned April 27th, 2012. What mm. happened that day? Uh, April 27th, 2012 is a day that's very close to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the first and primary one, um, because of 2012 is that was the day that I blew out. It was the last high school game that I ever threw. Um, it was first round of playoffs against Trinity Christian. It was actually up in Fort Worth, ironically, cause that would be where I go to college for the following five years. But um, at that time, I, I, you know, I was a highly touted draft prospect just to, just to be forthright. Um, that was something that the Lord had entrusted to me. And, um, you know, the season had been up and down because of, uh, a lot of things, mostly because of this condition called thoracic outlet syndrome. I didn't know I had it at the time. I'd get diagnosed about a month later, but it's where the nerves up in your collarbone, whenever you load your arm, they get crushed where you don't have any feeling in your fingers. Um, there's no blood flow, no circulation, no nothing. And so for me, I've been dealing with that. But but to be honest, I'd also been dealing of, with, with similar symptoms just regarding um, you know, anxiety. When I was being on the field, it just I wanted to do so well. I wanted to go so high in the draft. That's all I was really thinking about where back and forth I'd fought that all year. And on April 27th, it was the final culmination. I'd had tightness in my forearm all week and I threw a pitch and threw it 52 feet. And there was a huge shock down my arm and I knew it'd be the last pitch I throw in high school. Um, so that's exactly, you know, what happened. And, and to be honest with you, I would get diagnosed and stuff and they actually found it was TOS. And so I was thinking, okay, um, that's what it is. I got the surgery, got my rib removed, rehabbed all summer. Um, after, you know, wrote a letter to major league baseball saying, Hey, don't pick me. I'm going to school. And, hmm. uh, when I came back from rehab, it was my second week of my throwing program and my elbow still hurt. So I went and got an MRI again and they saw I had ripped it clean off the bone. And so back to back, I went thoracic outlet and Tommy John. And it really all started on that day or it really all came to a head on April 27, 2012. Is that a rock bottom moment in the sense of your sports career for you? Believe it or not, it's not. Um, I, I would say there might be a couple more that are a lot lower. simply because at that point, that was the first major injury I'd ever had. It was almost relieving because of what I'd been pitching through all spring um, with the nerve stuff. And um, if anything, I still had TCU to look forward to. So for me, right. it was disappointing in the sense of I'm not going to go pro out of high school. But looking back on it, I, I'm not trying to be cliche, but it, it's it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Hmm. So what were some of those rock bottom moments? If, if 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 you're if that's not a rock bottom moment, which it sounds pretty, I, I understand what you mean because I've talked to quite a few people on the podcast who've mm-hmm. who've said that there are people you know that there are moments in their lives that they go through that from the surface or from the world or even just from me listening sounds like that would be the worst thing that they went through and they say no that was the best thing because it helped me it gave me perspective it helped me deal with certain certain things but there's obviously difficult moments that we all go through low moments uh, what were some of those for you that you were alluding to earlier i would say what followed coming back from tommy john was one of the lower ones it wasn't the lowest and that was just so April 27, 2012 was obviously the day, you know, when I, I got hurt and that was it. I wasn't going to pitch. So I went thoracic outlet for the next eight weeks. And then I got um, and I was doing my throwing program and stuff. And then I was in the second week and I got Tommy John surgery on August 31st of that year, hmm. right after the thoracic outlet rehab. And then I would miss the next uh, year not pitching at all. Right. Um, TCU didn't do super well that year. So it wasn't that hard to sit out, but at the same time, just waiting and waiting, I would pitch that fall, you know, starting to work my way back. And then right before the season started, 
I'd get a stress fracture in my lower back, um, kind of out of nowhere. It happened within a week, literally just a week before the season started. And I'd sat out so long. Turns out it would be 24 months until I would pitch again. Uh, From April 27, 2012 um, to April of 2014, that'd be the next time I saw live in-game competition aside from those um, inter-squad scrimmages. So that was one of the lowest points, 24 months of sitting out. Not only that, just to be forthright, you know, I was talking about some of the anxiousness that I dealt with my senior year of high school because of the identity I had started to wrap up in baseball and the expectations I had set on myself and, and me wanting to just prove some things. And that I thought that that would go away. It compounded and exploded even where Hmm. by the time I was clear and healthy enough to go and pitch, everybody was just waiting on me to come and do what I was supposed to do at TCU. And for me, my identity was so wrapped up in there that it was like, okay, I haven't pitched in two years. I'm supposed to be this amazing baseball player. I can't screw up. So it was this mix of not playing forever and missing being out there on the field. And at the same time, having this burden of when you do, you better do well. Man, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of just, I guess, expectations certainly are a part of being an athlete, right? And you always want to expect to do well. But yes. to say those words, you better do well, as opposed to, man, I hope I do well. That changes the gamut a little bit in terms of how you have to of the pressure, I guess, that you put on yourself, right? I mean, I would say that that's the difference between, you know, having athletics be something that you do being a platform, which is what it's supposed to be and having athletics be an identity. Um, that word better or have to that, that, that burden of performance, because again, everybody in whatever they do wants to excel and do well. And we should like, that's glorifying to God. We should seek to maximize everything that we have, But when my identity started getting wrapped up in baseball and it had slowly been happening for some time because of some stuff that that happened in high school and things like that, it just all of a sudden that performance had to be there because if it wasn't, I didn't really know who I was. I didn't really think I would be valued. And it wasn't from my family by any means. It was more friend based. It was even more you know, girl based, just, just things like that, where I was looking for my value in so many different places. God was gracious enough to expose it, but that's where I crossed over that line of that responsibility being a gift turning into a burden. We've mentioned, obviously your faith, it's central to who you are. You've, you've alluded to it quite a bit. You went to TCU, Texas Christian university, the Horned Frogs, and uh, certainly did well there, but let's let's just hear your testimony for a minute because we love to hear that. I think that's the central point of every guest that we have on this podcast. Is you know I tell people all the time we have so many different guests, but yet they all have the same story, and it ends with Jesus or even starts with Jesus. So share with us your testimony a little bit, uh, and really the moment you made Christ the Lord of your life. So you know my, my the the front half of my testimony is is pretty vanilla. And and that's not a complaint. It's just, it's reality. I mean, I grew up in an amazing home with parents who they made it really easy to love Jesus. Um, and it wasn't because they shoved it down my throat or anything like that. It was because they were honest, they were knowledgeable and they were consistent in the way they lived their life Uh, in the way that my dad loved my mom and the way that my mom loved my dad and the way that they treated me and my brother and my sister. And terms of provision and protection and value system and activity in the church. And it it was, it was very easy for me to see the difference between what it meant to follow Christ and what it meant to be religious. It was really easy for me to see just how different being a Christian was from, you know, everything else, even from young ages where there's just so much you don't know. So I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, I got baptized when I was seven years old and I proclaimed Christ since I can remember but the tr- here's the tricky part is at some point in everyone's life, uh, no matter what they believe, every single person has a worldview um, that drives the way in which they live their life. Every, every single day we make decisions and that worldview will, will drive those decisions. And for me, um, you know, just like everybody else, I had to come to a place where I made my faith my own. 
where when it cost me something or when it wasn't convenient or where I wasn't in, a, in, a, in an environment where that was going on all the time and I had the freedom, the real freedom to make decisions, it was going to reveal what I truly believed. And that's um, really what happened when I got to college. You know, the back half of my high school years, I would be the guy who was professing Christ and could tell you, you know, every story in the scriptures and stuff or most of them because I was so well learned and so well churched. But um, there was fruit that was absent in my life, too, where I'm sure it was very confusing for people. One minute I'd be like this solid Christian who could give you advice. And on the back half, there were things that were far from God honoring and would suggest that I didn't know Christ at all. Mm. So when I got to college uh, and the Lord took baseball away, predominantly through the 24 months. But just to be forthright, from 2012 to 2019, I was hurt every single year without fail. Um, for some reason, God restored my health every year. There were a few of those injuries that have been career enders for other guys that I've played with. And that's not, um, a proud moment for me by any means. It's more so evidence of God's grace, but also these weren't little injuries. Um, they were big problems that caused me to miss meaningful time. So year after year through all these unexpected things as training adjusted and hard work, What the Lord was really doing was he was working on my heart. And that is my testimony is God used my injuries in baseball to lead me to him, to teach me that um, it wasn't enough just to know who he was or even to intellectually accept the fact that, you know, Jesus is king or even knowing that that I needed a savior. It was truly that need uh, that that dependence, like coming to that place where I understood in all things, both small and large, I've always needed him. He's always been there and me living intentionally with that awareness of my need for him out of that need for him. That was where the Christian life was going to start. And that happened in the basement of my uh, host family's house in Mankato, Minnesota, in the Northwoods League in 2014. Hmm. That's awesome. And you're also in college at that time at TCU, right? So how did TCU help shape you? You mentioned Chauncey Franks and being a character coach and a chaplain. I I would have to presume that that time at TCU really helped shape you and mold you. It did. So I love, first of all, I love the frogs. Um, I absolutely love the frogs. I'm a horned frog for life. I want to be involved for a long time there. And they have amazing people there. But I will say, um, just for those, you know, who are listening that don't know much about TCU, I know it's Texas Christian University, but, um, it's not an explicitly Christian university and that's not necessarily a knock as much as it's just reality. Um, it, it's, it's not, um, there are Christian organizations on campus. There are obviously other believers that you will meet, but the majority of people that I met at TCU, they didn't even profess to be Christian. And so that was the, that was one of the first surprises and thus, the importance for a man like Chauncey Franks to walk into my life as soon as he did. Um, You know, we got to know each other in the fall of 2012 when I was a freshman, had the sling on my arm, all those kinds of things. And we walked together every single day throughout my entire career at TCU. Um, He runs a very tight ship over there at FCA. He um, invests in countless number of athletes from every sport you can imagine. Um, Just super selfless, super giving. His staff is fantastic. I mean, he brought on different guys over the years, but some guys have gotten to know, you know, Coleman Maxwell works right alongside Chauncey Franks. He's been a huge influence in my life as well. Um, you know, and then just other people I met through FCA. I mean, that's really what acted as an anchor and really like helped me stay close to the Lord and really just like encouraged me even in that direction. While I was walking through the hard things where I even thought to to, to, to really, you know, seek the Lord and look into my own heart and wonder, like, was I, was I all in, like, were my chips all in? Was I really living consistently? Like, had I really given him my whole heart? Had I really entrusted him with the thing I loved most, which at the time was baseball. Mm. Um, and Chauncey and FCA were, were largely the driving force, um, in that along with my family. I'm looking at your, sort of resume here and your baseball journey obviously beginning or going through high school in the moment that you talked about in April of 2012 but you and you said you wrote a letter to Major League Baseball to tell them not to draft you and then as I look at your resume 2012 selected by the Astros 39th round 2015 selected by the Cardinals 28th round 2016 selected by the Reds 17th round and then 2017 selected by the Angels 
20th round, and thus that's when you would make your trek into professional baseball. That's mm-hmm. a lot of times to be drafted and a lot of different decisions to kind of yeah. walk through here. Take us through that. Why not go pro in any of those years, whether it's 2012, coming out of high school, or even 15 or 16? Yeah, so I appreciate you asking. Um, some of those decisions were very difficult. Um, in 2015, after being hurt for so long and then having the Mankato moment in 2014, I returned to campus in 15, a different guy. Um, and I told 22, that's coach Schlossnagel, but that's what we call him. Mm-hmm. Sat in his office and told him, Hey, look, yeah, I know you've known me for two years, but I just got to tell you something happened and I'm a different guy. Um, the Lord had done something to my heart where baseball was an ultimate and my career, however long it lasted, was going to be driven based off of the fact that it was a platform and I wanted him to do what he wanted to do and I wanted to be faithful in it. And that was it. And that would be the the crucible, if you will, that he would use to shape me. So 2015 turned out to be the greatest year of my baseball career ever. And I did not expect that by any stretch of the imagination. So after you know two years of being hurt and then having this crazy year and we go super deep and super regionals against Texas A&M favorite baseball memory ever. It just, there's so much that happened. You know, I got calls early, uh, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, and 11th round. Um, just to check if I wasn't sure. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, early they, you know, it wasn't at the, the number my family and I had agreed on. And then at the very end it was, and so it really got confusing because it was like, wow, okay. Um, I wanted to sign, um, or I was interested in signing. And then when the opportunity came, it just, there was just this overwhelming sense of you're not done yet. You've been there for three years. You've played for one, the relationships there, the people there, it was just, You know, it was a faith or fear moment is what it was. And one of the first ones I'd come across post Mankato, it was, you know, are you going to trust the guy that's going to take care of you and that he knows what's best? Or are you going to be afraid this opportunity will never come again? And for me, I didn't necessarily know for sure what would be the right answer, but I wanted to err on the side of faith rather than being afraid. And so that was why I chose to return. The Cardinals still took me later. Um, kind of like as a, we're watching you pick or just in case you change your mind. And, um, you know, just case in point, you know, one piece of fruit that followed the decision that I'm so thankful to have witnessed is one of my best friends, Evan Skaug. He was a, he's a TCU legend. He was a starting catcher there forever, you know, while I was there too, obviously. And, um, he got saved a couple months after I came back in 2016. And by God's grace, I got to witness that, mm. um, which I'll never forget that it's, I mean, it surpasses any baseball memory, um, that I've ever had college world series and all. So, um, that was 2015. And then 2016, you know, the short version is I got hurt a week before the season started. I had a grade two lat tear. I almost tore it completely off the bone. It was similar to what Noah Syndergaard did last year and, or maybe two years ago, but Um, I would miss almost the entire year. Um, I was a preseason All-American. I was assuming that year was going to be fantastic building off of that 2015 year. I think I had some expectations there where it was like, oh, I was faithful. So God's really going to bless my baseball career. It still kind of slipped into that mindset of, you know, God existing to to bless baseball rather than truly like, you know, just, just following him with whatever he had for me. And I would sit out almost the whole year. And then when I would return, I'd have to pitch through a lot of shoulder pain and, um, I almost wasn't able to get off the ground, but, um, you know, I was given the counsel that I I would be able to pitch through it. It wouldn't cause long-term damage. We could get it cleaned up at the end of the year. So all the way through that playoff run, um, I was pitching through what I would, what I knew would be shoulder surgery. Um, and that was a very lonely spot to be in because the only people that knew that were me, my parents, and then my coaches. And that's it. Mm. So, um, that, that was tough, you know, being on the national stage and pitching against some incredible teams during that time, knowing you're going to have to get shoulder surgery, you know, just keep throwing, you know, every, every pitch hurt, but the velo was, was enough where I could be effective and help my team. And that's ultimately what I wanted to do. The Reds took me, um, and believe it or not, as bizarre as this is, they took me without the intent to sign me. So I can't take credit for 2016 because I wanted with all my heart to sign, but that was the one year where I didn't even have the option um, right? because they knew I wouldn't pass a physical. So I was forced to return for my fifth year. Um, and then the fruit of that decision 
uh, is the best of all, um, that would be the year that I would start to date my now wife. <laughs> Isn't it funny how I always tell people when you look back is when you can see the Lord's plan in place. Obviously, when you're in the midst of it, it's really just about trusting, being faithful, seeking him. You're in his will in that moment. But it's not until you look back that you see, you know, Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Well, Yeah, Mitchell, your path is straight because you're following God, but this is anything but straight when it comes to your plans or what the Lord is, or what the world would would view as a straight path. I think that's fascinating to me. I really do. And I'm really, um, I'm just in awe of the fact that you are able to recognize that, even though a lot of people listening might be like, man, you're 25 years old and this baseball dream just does not. Uh, is not continuing for you. Can you take us through, because you wrote something that I thought was fascinating at the end of that uh, Instagram post in your retirement and said that you've gained some clarity. That was your quote, gaining some clarity on what the next chapter was for you. Share with us a little bit about that clarity that you gained in knowing that it was not just time, but that you know that God's directing these next steps for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was... Um, I mean, probably the biggest decision I, you know, I've made in my life, aside from following Christ and from marrying Olivia. Um, you know, the big thing there was I didn't know exactly what the Lord had. It wasn't like there was a slowly path where it's like, hey, you know, you're going to be a you know broker at this agency, or hey, you're going to go and speak, you know, lead this church, or right. It, it wasn't. There wasn't necessarily a clear next step in terms of, OK, you're good. You can let go of the whole baseball thing. It was it was really two things. The first thing was. I believe, especially now, the Lord had been preparing my heart for this for years, hmm. not in the sense of I was looking, you know, one I, you know, one foot in, one foot out, like kind of wonder what I would get out. It wasn't that at all. Um, I was chasing the big league dream and, and all my chips were in and I believed I could do it. Um, It was more so there was a time in my life where had baseball been taken away, I don't think I would have been able to handle it Um, simply because my identity was there. It just I couldn't picture my life without baseball. I would have crumbled. And who knows where that would have ended up. But through these injuries and through this time, the Lord had been preparing my heart where that dream, which was which legitimately was pitching in Yankee Stadium. That had been my dream since I can remember that that, that drove me through all kinds of stuff. I could lay aside that dream knowing as amazing as it would have been, because I'm sure it's amazing. And the people who have done it can attest to that. That wasn't where my value was. That wasn't going to complete me. That wasn't ultimate at the end of the day even if i went and pitched in yankee stadium for 20 years and was a hall of fame at some point no one's going to remember those stats at some point that stadium's going to crumble at some point just to be forthright i it, it, it was eternity that came into mind that allowed me to make that choice knowing baseball is a good thing but it's not where my identity is it's a platform and if god has me you know if god has a plan for me to go somewhere else and he has a different platform for me I need to be willing to do that. I need to be open handed about the gifts that he gives me. And that was what was made very clear was if I just look at what I walked through over those seven years, all the opportunities he given, all the things he had done, and then all the things I had done to maximize that potential. And then even seeing where I was, the current back injury at the time, there was so much writing on the wall combined with counsel where it was just logically speaking. That had I hung on to it and continued trying to play, it would have simply been out of just fear of letting it go. Mm-hmm. That would have been, um, I, I had given everything I had and it wasn't even an ability problem. It was just, that's not what the Lord had for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as far as the next step went, I didn't know much, but it almost, I, I like saying that because it's, I was certain that there was something else, but I wasn't certain what that something else was. But it almost gives me more confidence because it was like I wasn't weighing it against some other dream or some other fantasy or some other thing I had drawn up. It was just more so there was this unquestionable sense with me and my wife and those around me that it was time. Um, 
And as far as specifically as the next step goes, um, you know, I want to write a book. Um, there's nice. a lot that the Lord has done. Um, and there's a lot of details I'd like to share in the hopes that people could truly be encouraged in people in whatever profession and whatever platform, you know, that it could encourage them to focus on what actually matters in all that they do, which is faithfulness. That's, that's ultimately what baseball was about. That's what I want to be able to, to help people see through the story that he's given me and even just testify to the, the graciousness and goodness of God, even in disappointments. Um, and then specifically now I'll head into the marketplace. You know, I want to provide for my wife and we want to start building an income base. He don't make anything in minor league ball. I know a lot of people will be surprised, but, um, yeah. it's 1200 bucks a month for six months, you know? So, um, just trying to put food on the table. You know, we hope to start a family in a couple of years here, but writing a book, being available and, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Um, the thing that, that has driven me my whole life um, in bits and pieces and became more apparent toward the end of baseball. And then even now in terms of career choices and um, it's investing in men. That's, that's what I really am passionate about. That's what I really want to do is be able to be a voice that can invest in men, help sharpen men, walk with men and kind of model that um, picture of biblical manhood in the best way that I possibly can. Um, And so in whatever I do, wherever I go, wherever the Lord takes me, I do believe that will be the, the underwriting um, function of it all. Mm. Well, you've already invested in a lot of men because we have a lot of guys that listen to this podcast and just your wisdom and some of the words and things that you've shared have have encouraged me. And I know they've encouraged everyone listening here, Mitchell. As we close, I'm going to ask the last question because it's the same question I asked to all of our guests. You may have just answered it. So forgive me as an interviewer here asking a question that sort of brings to you for a a similar answer than you just said. But I'm going to ask it anyway. and Maybe it'll take you to a different place. But what are you learning from God today? What is he teaching you now in this season of life? You know, you're eight. I think you said you were married now eight months. Um, The retirement happened about a month ago or so as we taped this, maybe a little longer. So what are you learning from God today uh, in your life? Hmm. That's a great question. The word. um, So the word that that I had as a focus for this year um, was wait. Mm. Um, didn't, didn't really know what would come. It doesn't make me a prophet or something. It's just for some reason that was just, you know, every year my family and I, during New Year's, we'd like to, um, reflect on what God did the year prior and then going to the next one. It's like, if there's a word or two, that's something that, you know, we believe will be one of focus and you could, at the end of the year, you could name 30, but it just, it's helpful just for the sake even of intentionality. Um, and so for me, the word that, you know, I prayed through and I believe was, was placed on my heart was wait. And that's exactly what the Lord is teaching me today. And what he's been teaching me this whole year is, is what it means to wait on him. Um, there's two things there that I can say now. Um, and there's plenty more to come. I'm sure I'm far from a master in this subject, um, more like a novice, but, uh, number one, waiting is an active thing, not a passive thing. Yes. Um, that, that was super helpful for me, um, to, to really come to, it's not me sitting on my butt, just kind of waiting for God to move on my behalf and do nothing. And I'm just kind of floating around. It's waiting is, you know, you're, you're seeking his counsel. You're, you're, you're looking for his wisdom and his word. You're, you're pressing into the people and the community that he's placed around you. And while you're doing those things, you're waiting for him to direct your steps. You're waiting for him to, you know, help you overcome hurdles in your life. Like I was doing heading into spring training or waiting for him to, to open a new door. Like I'm doing right now, um, you know, waiting on a couple job offers, things like that. It's just waiting is an active thing. Um, and that was super helpful for me because I think sometimes I, in the past, I've thought of it as I'm just going to sit there and do nothing. And, you know, then you, you, it can just get very gray at that point. And, and he's really equipped us with a process, um, with his word, with, with people around us that love him and are following him that can help us learn to wait on the Lord. And then the second thing is there's a synonym from what I've seen in the scriptures. And even from what I've heard, some people I, I know and trust and respect talk about waiting on the Lord. Um, a synonym for the word wait is trust. Mm-hmm. And yes. 
that's, that's the other thing is, um, you know, as I've learned that waiting is an active thing, I've also learned that waiting means trusting. And so with those disappointments, with those redirections, so to speak, um, that's really what this year has been about is allowing the Lord to just not allowing him the sense of having permission because he can do what he wants, but allowing him the sense of he's going to have his way in my life and I'm not going to grumble. Um, I'm not going to worry. Like, you know, when I have anxiety or when I'm frustrated or any of those things, because I'm human. So you're going to feel those things. It's like, where do I go? What do I do with those emotions? Like, how am I going to process those things? You know, just redirecting it back to active submission and obedience to the Lord, active trust in him saying, I know, you know what you're doing. I know that you love me. You know, I think of Psalm 139, 16, you know, surely your eyes saw me when I was formless. All of my days were written down in your book and planned before a single one of them began. I've held that verse super, super close to my heart because it just reminds me that these days that are unfolding, God, God, God's had this, this plan a long way, way, way. He's so far ahead of me and, and every bit is with me now as ever. You know, he's both in front and present at the same time because he's, he's God and he's outside of time. And so just that sovereignty over all things, it gives me peace and it allows me to trust him. Um, and that's ultimately like why I used Romans eight twenty eight that often quoted verse yeah. uh, to finish off that Instagram post. And we know that all things work together for the good. Those who love God and are called in accordance to his purpose. And in my mind, that's, that's trust. Really good stuff there from Mitchell Traver, the former TCU uh, pitcher. And by the way, I didn't even allude to this, that you're six foot seven, 255 pounds. You're not a little guy. That's a big boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big yeah. Texas guy. Um, but yeah. listen, God's got great plans for you, Mitch. And I know this, uh, even though you're just 25 and the, and the baseball um, career is over, man, I can't wait to talk to you in like five or 10 years and just be like, man, we're not even going to be calling Mitchell Traver a former baseball player anymore. He's going to be whatever the Lord lays out in front of him, husband, dad, and certainly uh, minister of the gospel, I think is, is probably the big one. So listen, it's been great talking to you, my friend. Thanks for being so open and transparent on the podcast and uh, look forward to hopefully shaking your hand in person again sometime soon. Jason, I appreciate it. And just as a little aside, he did not tell me to say this. <laughs> Thank you for all the work that you do. Um, you, your podcasts have been an encouragement to me for a long time. Uh, your faithfulness in making the decision that you did leaving ESPN and moving to Sports Spectrum is a massive sense of encouragement. It just it even supercharged my faith in some ways. So thank you for your faithfulness and for allowing guys like me to just talk about what God has done. So I appreciate you, man. Yeah, thank you. And many thanks to Mitchell Traver, the former TCU pitcher, for joining us here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. It's a different type of story. Not every sports journey has a happy ending in a lot of ways. And uh, I really meant that when I said I can't wait to talk to Mitchell in five or ten years and hear the impact that he's going to make on people's lives for the kingdom. And so what if he never made it to the major leagues, right? This guy's got an amazing story, an amazing journey of being uh, obedient to God's call, staying faithful to where the Lord has brought him and where he's going to take him. And I love this interview. I really did. So I'm really thankful to Mitchell for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Many thanks to Mitchell and many thanks to our sponsors, Compassion International. For more information about how you can make a difference in a child's life, go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and consider sponsoring a child today. As always, you can reach us on our social media pages, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sports underscore Spectrum. You can check us out on our YouTube channel as well. Subscribe there. Never miss an episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast, both on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, our website, sportsspectrum.com. Check out the website. I'm telling you, you'll love the new look, the revamped site, lots of great content on there. All of our podcasts are there, a daily devotional every morning at 6 a.m., and an easy way for you to subscribe to our magazine. It's 18 bucks for an entire year for our quarterly magazine, and you can do it right there at the website, sportsspectrum.com, and subscribe to the magazine. You will love it. 
Thanks for listening. As always, we appreciate you. We love you. We hope you have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum.